Psalms 33, beginning with the 12th verse, says this, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chooses for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all of mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice. For we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Throughout history, we have known that America, in a lot of ways, has been blessed by God. But let's not make the mistake of feeling like America is the only nation that is blessed by God. Or America is blessed by God because of our political beliefs or because of our education or because of our great wealth. America in any country that puts God first and serves him and points to him for direction and looks to him for direction, God will bless. This scripture was originally written for, for Israel because God had put his blessing upon Israel. We've been grafted in that blessing simply because we have put our faith in God and our hope in God. John Maxwell tells the story of a small town that up in Maine that was announced that it was going to be flooded because they were putting a new hydroelectric plant in this area. And this small town was perfect. The land around it was perfect for it to be flooded to make this large reservoir. They gave the, the inhabitants of this town several months to prepare for what was going to happen. They bought the land from them so they were able to move all of those people out. But an interesting thing happened in the months that preceded, even the years that preceded that process happening, the people of that town, they, they stopped improving the town. They stopped painting. They stopped doing their lawns. They stopped doing repairs on things that needed to be repaired. And day by day, the whole town began to just get shabbier and shabbier. And long before the waters ever came and flooded that town, the town looked uninhabitable. It looked uncared for, even though there were some people that had never yet moved away. The citizens explained this, where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. The town was cursed when it hopelessly gave up that there was no future. I am afraid today that in some respects, we in some ways are going down that same road. When we don't see a future in America, we give up hope in today. Many of our communities, we hear and we've been indoctrinated by the media and other people that there's no hope, that America is going downhill, there's no help, there's no way that we're ever going to come out of this. But I believe this morning that there is hope for America. How can you have faith in a future in our country when we're so divided at every corner? Families are divided, churches are divided. Schools are divided. Even our communities are divided. Instead of focusing on our differences, let's focus on what unites us, that we are all and we have all been dead in trespasses and sin, and that we have come alive in Christ, that we as a nation and we as a people and as a human race were bought with a price, and we have been given this gift to give to others and to love the people who are around us. That's what hope is. If this morning I was to talk about hope and give you some remedies for hope, I'll, I'll give you three things this morning. And some of this may seem like a civics lesson because I'm going to go back and give a little bit of a background of why we need to have that hope and why our hope is present in America today. Number one is this. Our hope is in God. Our hope is in God. 
I think it's interesting that, especially in the New Testament, whenever you see the word hope, and many times in the Old Testament, when you see the word hope, it's metaphorically placed in there to give us a hope that that hope is in heaven, that we have an inheritance, that we have a home that we're waiting to, to, to be in one day in heaven for those of us who follow and believe that Christ died for our sins and we choose to follow him. We have that hope, and our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in God. It's not a political hope. It's not a, a, a hope that our society will finally become so diverse and so accepting. But at the end of diversity and at the end of acceptance is this word called love that I am afraid that many times in our church we forget the word love because we're so busy dividing people into segments and sections and you sit here and you sit here and you are this and you are that. Forget all that. Just love the people who are around you and let God take care of everything else. Can I get an amen from somebody in the house this morning? We, we started out the right way. Our country was developed the right way. Our nation, for the most part, came into existence by conquest and, and, and self-ambitions and motives that were righteous and that were pure. But it was primarily in the atmosphere of God, not of gold, that our America was born. The hardy souls who sailed on the Mayflower in 1620 fled from tyranny and oppression. And in the Mayfire Compact, which they signed on that ship, they signed it before they ever got here, they proclaimed that they had come to a new world for this, the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. That was why the pilgrims came to this new land. In the early colonies, the first public building erected was a church. The first public exercise was the act of worship of Almighty God. When sorrow came to that community and people died, they gathered at the church to call upon God for help. When bountiful harvest came and they, were, they, they had great harvest to fill their barns, they came to the church to give God thanks and praise for what he had blessed them and how he had taken care of them. In 1643, as more people arrived from the shores and they gathered together, the New England Confederation was written. They wrote a constitution, the first constitution written in the New World, and it began with these words, whereas we all came into these parts with one and the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the enjoy the liberties of the gospel in purity and peace. That's why it started that's the founding fathers, and that's how our country came about. Around 150 years later, by the time that the earliest settlers had begun to form the nation, we were very proud um, that some of the great things had happened over the years. But there were many other things that began to happen after these first forefathers and the first pilgrims passed away and died. The colonists became more concerned with increasing their wealth and comfortable living than with faith in God and his word. 150 years after they came, this began. And as wave after wave of immigrants began to come to our shores and began to come and settle here, they brought different beliefs, different ideologies. Their concern was more for wealth and for advancement than it was for honoring God. England began a program of emptying its prisons by making it possible for prisoners to come to the new world as indentured servants. At the same time, the King of England granted vast tracts of land in this new world to these prisoners, criminals who had been released, and worked as, uh, and, and, and slavery began to be seen, and they began to bring slaves over to take care of their lands and create plantations. The spiritual atmosphere uh, deteriorated rapidly. Churches were dying, and many of them had lost their religious freedom and had given in to money and to prosperity and bringing in more slaves and accumulating, uh, accumulating all of their wealth. The end result is by 1730, 
only about 10% of the people in the colonies attended church. That which had begun for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith had almost disappeared from our country. By the way, much of what you hear negatively about our country in the past and about slavery and the things that took place took place during this time that Christianity was beginning to decrease and secularity and, and evil was beginning to, to grow. Beginning in 1734, a handful of preachers, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, Gilbert Tennant, and John Wesley, and, and among others, began to preach in the churches and in the streets of America and in the fields. These soon turned to great crusades and revivals and spread through the 13 colonies. So many people came to Christ during this era. It was known as the Great Awakening. Tens of thousands dedicated their lives to Jesus Christ and were baptized. So many came to hear Whitfield as he traveled the colonies that he had to hold open-air meetings because there just wasn't enough room in their churches. Benjamin Franklin wrote, It was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seems as if all the world were growing religious or irreligious, so that one could not walk through the town in the evening without hearing psalms sung in different families on every street. We began to see revival come. Why? Because when people get so far from God, when we start to see such wickedness rule in the world, that God's people finally will call upon him and return back to what they know is right and return back to a God that saves and heals and delivers. I've heard people say, if God doesn't bring judgment upon America soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. We look around our world today, and if you just stop and think about the facts of what you see, it just doesn't make sense. We look and we see the things that happen in the world today where we want to take children who are even underage children that by, by some means have been indoctrinated or convinced that their gender is not the gender they were born with, and now we're trying to pass laws to allow them to go in and people to do surgery on these young children to change their gender before they even reach an, an age of accountability or puberty because we believe that they are a certain way or they believe that they are a certain way and we want to mutilate these young bodies so that they can be changed into something that they're going to regret later. And we look at that in a society and say, well, that's okay, that's a parent's right. You know what, they used to do this in, in, back in Roman times where they would take kids and they would mutilate them or do things to them. You know, I grew up in, in, in music, and, and that was my background growing up. I've got it. My undergrad is in music education. We learned that back in, in, in France and Germany and, and places like that, back when the, the classics were really coming out and they were writing great music, that if a young boy had a beautiful soprano voice and he could sing high and pure, it was so pleasing and so beautiful, but they knew that when he began to go through puberty, his voice would change and it would drop, that they actually would take these young boys and they would castrate them so that their voices would not change. And they called them, today it's known as castrati tenors, that these young boys would keep that high voice, and they did that for years. And it wasn't just a few at one time, there was over 5,000 boys a year were being castrated so that they could be able to sing. Why? So that they could be able to, to, to make money for the, the groups that, were, that they were singing for or so that they could be, have a beautiful voice for the rest of their life. And we're, we look at that nowadays and we think that is crazy that they would do that because it would change that young man's life forever. But yet we look at our society today and forgive me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rant a little bit on my own beliefs and all this kind of stuff. But when we have the Supreme Court that can make a decision that a mother can make a choice to kill the child that's inside of her because she chooses to do that, 
When we look at a society that can choose to do that, and even in some states, they're saying now that you can have abortions all the way up to the birthday, and even after the child is born, you can make the decision, the mother and the doctor can make the decision whether that child is going to live or die because that mother has the right to do that. I look at that and say that's wrong. I look at that and say that human life ought to be there and it, it starts at conception when there's a heartbeat. Your choice isn't whether that child should live or die. Your choice is whether you should get pregnant or not and whether you should be living that kind of life. Now, I realize, I realize there's always the exception for rape and incest and all those kind of things. Those are very, th those, those are out there. And I understand that that's a choice that you're going to have to make. But I don't believe the government should be making that choice or imposing that or saying something is right or wrong. When I look at that, I see that we live in this wicked society that's trying to, to make people think that something is different than what it is. Let's just stop for a second and look at the sanctity of human life. God wants every child. God, God anointed and called people before they were even born. In, while they were in the womb, he knew them, the scripture says, and he called them. And you can have your own views, and I know many of you in here have maybe had to grapple with that and make those choices, and I'm not here to try to make you feel <clears throat> guilty in any way or not. I'm just saying that when we have a society who wants to view these kind of things as normal, I'm just saying that we need hope in our society, and God needs to come and bring revival to America, revival to the world, and save us and take us in a better direction. Do you agree with that? Let me keep going. When we put our hope in the right person, in the right reason, right things will happen. When we put our hope in the right person for the right reason, right things will happen. It's possible to put your hope in the right person, but for the wrong reason. Many people in Israel who had looked for the Messiah, they finally, when they met Jesus, he finally came, but they didn't recognize him, and they were looking for the wrong thing. They had the right person, they were just looking for the wrong reason, the wrong thing. Even when John the Baptist's disciples came to Jesus and asked him in Luke the seventh chapter, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? So he replied, Jesus replied to the messenger, go back and report to John that you, what you have seen and heard, that the blind receive their sight, that the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. So basically Jesus was saying, listen, go back and just tell John what you've seen. Go back and tell him what you've seen happen. You see, the people had their confidence in Jesus, but just for the wrong reasons. They saw him as a, a, a healer. They didn't see him as a savior. And today... I'm afraid that we're looking for someone to come and deliver us, to take us out of our situation, to fix whatever is wrong in our life, to get us off of drugs, to get us more money, to, to give us a better job, to, to give us a, a spouse, a husband or a wife, uh, to, to let our dog run away and then it never comes back again. But we don't need a deliverer. We need a savior. Amen? We need a savior. She is just so extra sometimes. I don't know. I've got pictures. I should have shown them this morning of her in the back seat, and she's huddled down, and I know she's praying. I can hear her back there invoking the name of Jesus and asking for deliverance. And, I mean, it wasn't that bad, all right? And I was driving, so. But I'm thankful this year she didn't get out of the truck and walk because that's usually what she does. Just let me out. Just let me out. I'm saying, okay, then we'll all die, and you'll survive. What are you going to do then? And she just said, I upped your insurance policy before I left, so I'm good. Okay, all right. We need to seek the right person for the right reason. Maybe we're asking the wrong questions. Instead of asking God to heal us or God to deliver us, maybe we need to ask God to break our hearts for what breaks his. Maybe we need to ask God to let us see the world the way he sees the world. Maybe we should value the things that he values instead of getting all political about everything. Whether there is no faith in the future, where there is no faith in the future, there's no power in the present. God, help us. And the last one is, so how do we get power in the present? If, if, if there's no power today, how do we get power in the present? Well, 
I've got a great verse for you. Acts 1.8 says this. 1.6-8 through 8 says this. Then the disciples gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Interesting question. I'm not going to jump into this. I just wrote a big paper on this that I'm presenting here at the end of the month to, at, a, at a, a conference, and so I don't want to jump into this too awful much. But this is an interesting question because the disciples are asking Jesus, is, is this the kingdom of God? Are you going to restore Israel? Is this the Messiah that's going to come with force and might and going to conquer us? I, what they're asking, Lord, are you going to deliver us? Are you going to deliver us? Is this the time you're going to come and make us kings, make us the ones who are in power and in charge and going to take care of all of our debt, all of our worries? Is this when you're going to do this? And Jesus says this. He said to them, it's not for you to know the dates the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, don't worry about that. But here's the thing you need to know. But here's the thing. They're asking about power. Now he answers them. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, but also in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So when they were asking for deliverance, he gave them not just deliverance, but he says, you will have power. You will have power. And that power is to go and to spread the gospel. How do we spread the gospel? The only way you can spread the gospel is to love the people who are around you. Have you ever met a minister that you felt was always mad at everybody? He was always screaming and yelling at people. Do you know guys like that? Hopefully you guys don't see me like that. I try my hardest to smile when I'm talking like this and saying what's wrong with you and what's wrong with me. But if we can't do it in love, it's not the gospel because the essence of the gospel is love. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. He did it because he loved you. He did it because he saw hope in mankind as the mess ups that we are, humankind, as the mess ups that we are. He still did it because he saw hope in us and wanted there to be something greater than what was happening. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the disciples were now being taught about this process of hope and of love. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, he says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. After he goes through in, verse, in chapter number 12 and talks about the gifts, the gifts of the Spirit and what they are and how you use them in your life. And he says this is kind of a cliffhanger for the next verse. Now eagerly desire the greater, the greater gifts. Well, what are the greater gifts? Well, he tells you starting in verse number 13, or in, verse, in chapter 13, verse number 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Love is the key. Down in verse number 13, at the end of that, he says, Now of these three that remain, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. Love is the thing that brings power and hope to your life. That love, how do we get it? It comes from the Holy Spirit. Look at Romans, the fifth chapter, the first verse. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not so, not only so, but we also glory in our, listen to this, our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. Now, I, I love this portion of scripture because you see the linear nature of this. He says we rejoice in sufferings. Because unless you go through sufferings, you'll never experience persecution and you, or perseverance. And if you'll never experience perseverance, you'll never experience character. And if you never experience character, you'll never experience hope. In other words, you got to go through some stuff in life before you're going to get to the place where you have hope. If your hope is only in mom and dad and they dish you out everything you want or your hope is always in the government and they give you free money and they give you everything that you want and you don't have to go through hard times in your life, you'll never experience the hope that's found in Jesus Christ, the hope that's found in God. But our hope is not in government assistance. Our hope is not in a mom and dad that have a good job and then give us money. But our hope is in God. And that hope comes through the Holy Spirit. Let's keep reading this. And hope, verse number five, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit 
who he has who, who he has given to us. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us hope because the Holy Spirit, the ultimate goal of that is to produce love, to give the world hope. Our hope comes from the outpouring of love into our lives that comes from the Holy Spirit. And that's the process that we go through. So let me read this last part here. Happy birthday, America. It's been 246 years that you're, it's been 246 years ago this year. That's a long time for a nation to remain free, but when you take the long historical view, you're just a child among other nations. Egypt, China, Japan, Rome, and Greece all have longer histories, but are not so free. Happy birthday, America. You have a rich spiritual history that continues to influence us today. My Country, Tis of Thee was written by a Baptist minister, Samuel Francis Smith. The Pledge of Allegiance was written in 1892 by a Baptist minister, Francis Bellamy. The words, In God We Trust, were traced to the efforts of Reverend W.R. Watkinson. Reverend John Witherspoon, a Presbyterian minister, was a signer in the Declaration of Independence. Happy birthday, America. Your entire history has spanned only five generations. When Thomas Jefferson died, Abraham Lincoln was a boy, was a young man of 17. When Lincoln was assassinated, Woodrow Wilson was a boy of eight. By the time the nation mourned the death of President Wilson, Ronald Reagan was a boy of 12. And now a new generation has begun. But even though you have this short history, God has richly blessed you. You are the richest nation in the world. Your national resources are still the greatest of all nations. Happy birthday, America. You're a great nation with a great history. When you were very young, a famous political philosopher visited the shores, visited your shores to learn the secret which enabled a handful of people to defeat the mighty British Empire. He traveled again, a, a, across your vast shores, from shore to shore and across the land, looking for greatness in your harbors and rivers, your fertile fields and boundless forests. He studied your schools, your military, your Congress, your Constitution, but still he could not find the secret. It was not until he went to your churches and heard your pulpits aflame with righteousness that he found the answer. When he returned to Europe, he wrote this warning, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Happy birthday, America. You are great because you are good. You are good because you are still opening your doors to those from under other lands remembering that you are made up of those who came to your shores searching for freedom and opportunity. You are great because you still are the most generous nation, giving untold millions to third world countries, sending our missionaries to feed the hungry and starving souls throughout the world. You are great because your citizens are free and they choose, they have the right to choose whom and where they worship. You are great because you still take the side of the little guy against the bullies of the world. Happy birthday, America. The noble, in our, the noble lady in New York Harbor stands proudly with her flame lifted to all who see a gift from the French. She still inspires those of us who are born here and those of us who have come from other countries of the freedom that it offers to all. Happy birthday, America. Your flag waves proudly in the free air, a symbol of all who makes you great, all that makes you great. Whether at a ball game, a political rally, a concert, or worship service, she still sends a chill up and down our spine. Happy birthday, America. Your currency, your currency still carries the motto, in God we trust. May we learn to transfer this motto from our heads to our hearts. Happy birthday, America.